Hello, I'm Shelley Quinn. Today on 3ABN Sabbath School panel, we will be studying Lesson 2, God's Covenants with us. Of course, our quarterly is managing for the master till he comes. Let me, before we pray, introduce our family here at 3ABN. We know this is your, one of your favorite programs, and it's certainly one of ours because we have so much fun when we get together and we take our Bible study seriously. We don't take ourselves as seriously. Let me introduce John Dinsey. It's a blessing to be here. I have Monday's lesson, and it says to hearken diligently. Amen. Amen. And Brother Brian. <laughs> I'm Ryan Day, and I have Tuesday's lesson entitled, Honor the Lord. Pastor John Lovacain. Wednesday, the tithe contract. Mm -hmm. mm. And then my dear sister in Christ, Jill Moore Coney. Thank you, Shelley. I have Thursday, seek ye first. Amen. And speaking of seek ye first, could you say a prayer for us, sure. Jill? Holy Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus, grateful for the gift of your word and the gift of your spirit. And we seek right now for clean hands and a pure heart that you would open up our minds and hearts that we would hear and receive what you have for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Jill, for that beautiful prayer. Our memory text today is Deuteronomy 28, 1 and 2. The Word of God says this, Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all His commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. You can't even run away from God's blessings. Amen. because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Throughout the Old and the New Testament, we see that obedience is the pathway to God's blessings. If there is one thing that unites all Scripture, it is that our God is a covenant-making, covenant-keeping God. God makes two kinds of covenants with mankind. There is a unilateral covenant, where God just makes the promise and man doesn't have to do anything. When he told us about the rainbow, he, we didn't have to do anything. When he talks about the rain coming on the just and the unjust, we don't have to respond. But there's also a bilateral covenant that God makes. This requires a human response to enter into covenant relationship with God. Now, this is interesting. Some people see God's covenants as contracts. Where did they get this idea? 280 times in the Old Testament, the word for covenant that is used is berit, B-E-R-I-T. And what that means is to bind. It is used mostly of God, but it also describes covenants kind of a, a contractual arrangements between mankind. But I have to say this, if we only had the Hebrew, we'd come away believing that God makes contracts. I personally believe, personally believe God does not make a contract with man. Let me tell you why. During the 400 year intertestamental time when there was silence from Malachi to Matthew, a group of Hebrew scholars got together and they translated the Old Testament from Hebrew to Greek. Now in the Greek, there's two words for covenant. One is syntheke, that's a contract between men. The other is diatheke, and what that means, it is a will, a testament, or a testimony describing somebody's desired will. This is interesting. All 70 of these translators, independently working, all used the word diatheke. That means a will, a, a, an expression of God's will when they referred to God. And the New Testament writers, the New Testament was written in Greek. For all of God's covenants, they are called Diatheke. So what that means is that God is the one who makes all the promises. God is the one who keeps all of the promises. When it comes to the salvation covenant, which is what our Sunday's lesson is about, salvation 
is by grace through faith, not of works that anyone should boast. There's nothing we can do to earn our salvation. It is offered to us as a gift, but God asks us to enter into covenant relationship with him, which means we will walk in loyalty and obedience motivated by love. Think about this. Our God has had this everlasting covenant. Revelation 13, 8 says that the Lamb was slain before the foundations of the world. God's always had this plan to make us righteous by faith. Hebrews 13, 20 says that Christ's blood is the blood of the everlasting covenant. And what is the goal of the everlasting covenant? 2 Corinthians 5, 21, the great exchange. God would put all of the sin on a sinless Savior, Jesus Christ, the person who became our substitute so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. So Christ opened the pathway for righteousness by faith to us and He made salvation. He died for everyone in the world. He paid the penalty for all the sins in the world, but not all will be saved. We have to enter into covenant with God and by submitting and committing to Him. So in Christ, the Bible says we are justified mm -hmm. by faith. That's, we're made righteous. The penalty for our sins was paid and we're justified, declared not guilty by faith in Christ. But also in Christ, we are sanctified mm -hmm. by faith. That means we are, it's his infused power as the Holy Spirit dwells in us and Christ dwells in our hearts through faith by the Holy Spirit. We are sanctified and separated from the power of sin. We must learn to yield to his expressed will as expressed in the Bible. What excites me about the everlasting covenant of righteousness by faith is that God, as soon as mankind sinned, God introduced it in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3.15. Then as we go down, we see the father of us all, who is Abraham. In Genesis 15.6, it says, he believed the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. And then right there in Genesis 15, God confirms and this uh, ratifies this covenant in the form of a vision. But now people say, oh, we're made righteous by faith. Why do we need to be concerned about obedience? Well, when Genesis 15, we know that Abraham was somewhere between the ages of 75 and 86 because he was 86 when he had Ishmael. But we don't know exactly what his age is. But when he was 99 years old in Genesis 17, the man that God made righteous by faith, listen to what he says. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I am almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. What does that sound like? And he says, and I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. You see, salvation is a free gift. There's absolutely no way that you and I can save ourselves. All of the obedience in the world isn't going to save you. You've just got to go to the Lord, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, but also as your Lord and Master. So, what God is inviting, as I said, he died for everyone. Not everyone will be saved unless you enter into covenant with him by saying, Lord, I'm ready to submit my life, commit myself to you. Listen to what Jesus said, Matthew 7, 13 through 14. He says, enter by the narrow gate for wide is the gate, broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life. And there are few that find it. Hmm, what does he mean? He goes on in verse 21 of Matthew chapter seven. 
He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. His will is his covenant. Many will say to me in that day, he's talking about the last day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And listen how he responds to them. He says, then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now, lawlessness means you're not paying any attention to his law. Mm-hmm. Hebrews 5, 9. This is, it's so important to understand obedience is a requirement of God. Hebrews 5, 9 says, having been perfected, speaking of Jesus, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. See, God's goal of this everlasting covenant is to make us righteous. We are made righteous by faith. But I love what John says. John says in 1 John, uh, I'm trying to remember where, but 1 John, he says, only he who practices righteousness Mm -hmm. is righteous. Uh, Psalm 85, 13 says, righteousness goes before the Lord, Jesus Christ. And it's our pathway to follow. So 1 John 5, we know that we are saved by grace through faith. And listen, I want you to know today, you can have assurance of salvation. You know what? You can even have assurance of obedience if you just surrender to the Lord, yield to his leading and say, Lord, work in me to will and to do your good pleasure. Because God has promised in Philippians 1, 6, that he who's begun a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. But here's your assurance of salvation. First John chapter 5, 11 through 13. This is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He who has the son has life. If you're in Christ, if you're walking in obedience, motivated by love, you're in Christ. He says, he who does not have the son does not have life. And he said, these things that I've written to you, who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and you may continue to believe in the name of the Lord. Amen, amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much. We now move to Monday's portion. My name is John Dinsey, and uh, we are going to look at the title, To Hearken Diligently, To Hearken Diligently. And so here, uh, I'd like to take you to Deuteronomy chapter 1 first, uh, the lesson brings out chapter 28, but I think I need to give you a little background first. In Deuteronomy chapter 1, we see that Moses begins like his farewell message to the people of Israel because the Lord has shown him that he must rest uh, by, he was going to pass away. The Lord was going to put him to sleep. And so now he's giving his farewell message and he kind of recounts the story to the children that are now before them because now this is a new generation of the people of Israel. In Deuteronomy chapter 1, I'm going to begin in verse 2. It says, It is 11, day, 11 days' journey from Horeb to, by way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea. Now it came to pass in the 40th year, in the 11th month, on the first day of the month, that Moses spoke to the children of Israel according to all that the Lord had given him as commandments to them. During the, the book of Deuteronomy, uh, during this message, he, he recounts to them history, but also he repeats the Ten Commandments. Now he tells them what happened. He says in verse 6, Deuteronomy 1, 6, The Lord our God spoke to us in Horeb, saying, You have dwelt long enough uh, at this mountain or near this mountain. And as he continues in verse 7 and verse 8, he tells them in verse 8, Go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them and their descendants after them. This is the Lord intended to bring them into the promised land. 
But as you continue reading in verse in chapter 1, you will notice that the people of Israel became afraid after, after they spied out the land and they came back with a report, oh no, there are giants in the land. Mm -hmm. And so they were so afraid that uh, they says their heart was so discouraged and they refused, they rebelled, they didn't want to go forward. And so because of this, they had to dwell 40 years in the wilderness. Uh, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 31. It says, And in the wilderness where you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son in all the way that you were until you came to this place, yet for all that you did not believe the Lord your God who went in the way before you to search out a place for you to pitch your tents to show you the way you should go in the fire by night and the cloud by day. So they had already seen about a year of miracles from the Lord, the first generation. And it's still, they did not believe. I mean, they had seen the Red Sea open before them and the Egyptians swallowed up in the water and they did not believe. So now they, were, they were, had to wander in the desert. Moses retells. Now, now we move to Deuteronomy chapter 4. I'm going to read verse 1 and 2. Now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and judgments which I teach you to observe that you may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your father is giving you. He's giving you this land. You shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take from it that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Notice beautiful words in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 6. Therefore, be careful to observe them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of all the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has God so near to it? And as the Lord our God is to us, for whatever reason we may call upon him. He's trying to bring to their attention that the other nations are going to be amazed at the wonderful commandments that they have and how healthy they are and all the blessings that God, pour God pours upon them. He's bringing them aware of the blessings because we need to do it. Each and every one of us needs to remember the blessings that God has given us that we may continue to be encouraged and go forward. Look at verse 8. And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all this law which I set before you this day? There's no nation like you. And so now I move to Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 29. Oh, this is God speaking. Oh, that, there, that they had such a heart in them mm -hmm. that they would fear me and always keep all my commandments. Why? That it might be well with them and with their children forever. Mm -hmm. And this is a message for us as well. If we obey God's commandments, the Lord will do the same for us. It will be well for us and for our children. Notice in Deuteronomy chapter 8, reminding them again, I'm going to go through verse 1 through 5. Every commandment which I command you today, you must be careful to observe. Over and over again, be careful to observe. Do not change anything. It says that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the, all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you to know what was in your heart so that you're aware what's in your own heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna from heaven, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but uh, man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Yeah. Notice this, wonderful. Your garments did not wear out on you, nor did your foot swell these 40 years. You should know in your heart that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord your God chastens you. They, their shoes did not wear out, their clothing did not wear out, their feet did not swell. Uh, if there were any stores like, uh, well, I'm not going to mention stores, they would, they would have gone out of business. They wouldn't be able to sell shoes or clothing because God protected them and preserved them. Now let's go to De Deuteronomy chapter 28. And it says here, the question we have before us is, what great blessings are promised to people? But mu what must they do to receive them? Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1, And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt 
hearken diligently, that is to diligently obey, uh, unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. You will be blessed above every nation. And all these blessings shall come on you and overtake you. Uh, this is the King James Version. Overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. And now notice verse 3. Blessed shalt thou be in the city, and blessed shalt thou be in the field. Blessed shalt thou be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy ground, and the fruit of thy cattle, the increase of thy kind, that is the herd, and the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shall thou be shall be thy basket and thy store. Blessed, blessed shall thou be when thou comest in. Blessed shall thou be when you goest out. It was just blessing upon blessing upon the people if they hearken diligently. Notice verse 7. The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thee, before thy face. They shall come out against thee one way and flee before thee seven ways. What marvelous protection the Lord promised the people of Israel. And now Moses is recounting these things and telling them the blessings that can come upon them if they diligently hearken, that is, if they obey. Notice verse 7, the Lord shall cause thine enemies to rise up against thee. We read that one. Let's go to verse 8. The Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in thy storehouses and in all that thou settest thine hand to do, and he shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Mm. These are marvelous blessings. Let's move to verse 9. The Lord shall establish an holy people unto himself, as he has sworn unto thee, if thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in all his ways, and all the people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord, yeah. and they shall be afraid of thee. And the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods, in the fruit of thy body, and in the fruit of thy cattle, and in the fruit of thy ground, and the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers to give thee. The Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure, the heaven to give the rain unto thy land in his season, and to bless all the work of thine hand. And thou shalt lend unto many nations, and thou shalt not borrow. <laughs> and the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail, Thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath, if thou, what, hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and to do them. And thou shalt not go aside from any of the words which I command thee this day to the right hand, nor to the left, to go after other gods to serve them. These were the promises that God presented before the people of Israel. Commandments, uh, and they were conditional upon them obeying. And of course, we know that what God commands us to do, He gives us the power to do. He helps us accomplish each and every one. And so it is today. God tells us, obey my commandments again, and we will live. He gives us the power, and we cooperate with the, with the Lord to receive the blessings that Amen. He has for us. Thank you, Pastor Johnny. As it was in the Old Testament, it is in the New. God, the pathway to God's blessings has always been obedience. Jesus wants it to be motivated by love. He Amen. said in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. So now we're going to take a break. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 Abian Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3abnsabbathschoolpanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. And now we will continue with Tuesday's lesson with Ryan Day. Amen. Thank you guys for setting such a great foundation. I have Tuesday's lesson entitled 
honor the Lord. And actually I put in here as kind of a, a continued title. If I were to, 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 to just extend this a little longer, it would be honor the Lord in putting him first, because that was basically the basis of what we are studying on Tuesday's lesson, because the bulk of this lesson actually has us going to the third chapter of Proverbs. So get your Bibles. Let's go to the third chapter of Proverbs. Many of us know uh, a couple of verses that we often hear quoted uh, quite often from this particular passage, but we're going to read the first 10 verses and I'm going to make some notes and some points along the way that we can glean from this and, and uh, basically learn in how God is calling us to honor him. Um, actually, point number one, I'm just going to go Proverbs. Proverbs chapter three, verses one through 10. Um, and I'm going to start with my very first point, which is obedience brings peace and longevity. Uh, Sister Shelley and Brother Denzi have uh, set a clear foundation for the significance and importance of obedience through God's commandments. But I'm going to read Proverbs chapter 3, uh, verses 1 and 2, and then we'll go from there. So notice what the Bible says. It says, My son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commands. For length of days and long life and peace, they will add to you. That's why I, it makes no sense whatsoever to me, Pastor Loma King, when I hear people say, well, we're not under the, you know, they'll take Paul's writings and they'll twist it to their own destruction. You know, we, we're not under the law, we're under grace. And then they'll twist that to mean, you know what, they're exempt from the law. They don't have to keep the law. They just love Jesus and accept his name, accept his salvation mentally, but yet they live a life contrary to the commandments of the Lord. And, and my friends, that, again, the Bible has this message over and over and over again that blessed you will be if you keep his commandments. Again, not that they bring us salvation, not that we gain salvation because of, of the keeping of any law, but because we are saved and we have a relationship with him and we're in covenant relationship with him for what he has done for us, we will want and the motivation will be to obey him because we love him. And so obedience brings peace and longevity. Uh, Exodus chapter 20 verse 12 came to mind again because it brings out the fact that in verse 2 of Proverbs 3, for length of days and long life and peace, they will be added to you. But obviously I, I thought of Exodus 20 verse 12, which happens to be the fifth commandment. And what does it say? Honor your father and mother right. that your days may be long upon the land, which the Lord your God is giving you. And so again, that promise there that if you want to live a long, happy life, again, we don't know how long that life's going to be, but God promises that he will bring that blessing upon you if you will genuinely obey him. Exodus 19, 5 and 6 brings again that beautiful blessing of God is he's, he's looking for a covenant relationship with his people. Exodus 19 verses 5 and 6 as he was calling Israel to be his champions, to be his people, his beacon of light to the rest of this world. He says, now therefore if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people for all the earth is mine and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And so again when people come at me and say, oh we don't have to keep the commandments of God. You know what? When they say that, when you say, when you twist that message and say, we're not under the law, we don't have to keep the commandments. What you're saying is God made a mistake. That back here, God said, you know what? I, I'm asking you, I'm commanding you to keep my law and to be obedient. But they say, oh, no, no, God got it wrong. And so he came along and he sent his son to do it perfectly for us, which is true. But now we're exempt from it, from having to keep that law because Jesus done it perfectly for us. Well, he did do that. He paid the, he paid the price. He, he redeemed us in, according to the gospel message. But at the same time, yes, because he has, because we are saved, we want to follow in obedience. We're not exempt from that. Isaiah 48, verse 18, Oh, he says, oh, that you had heeded my commandments. Yes. Then your peace would have been like a river and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. That's such a beautiful, God just is sharing his heart. Oh, that you would obey me. And in Proverbs 29, 18, what does it say? Where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint, but happy is he who keeps the law. How many people want to be happy? I know I want to be happy. And again, I'm not, I don't keep the commandments of God. I don't strive to keep those commandments because it brings me salvation. Jesus Christ in his shed blood has brought me salvation, but I want to do it because he loves me and I want to live a long, peaceful and happy life according to his promise. Let's continue in Proverbs 3 on to verse 3 and 4. Proverbs 3 verses 3 and 4. He says, let not mercy and truth forsake you. I'm reading the New King James Version. It says, bind them around your neck, write them on the table of your heart and so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and men. 
did a little bit of digging here, looked at some other translations because I wanted to know what is he, you know, again, you could take that mercy and truth and, and go with it. But I started noticing other translations said things like, uh, said things like, you know, uh, having mercy, meaning, uh, you know, having compassion or kindness. And of course, truth, trustworthiness, which is es essentially what this is teaching us to lead a life. This is our second point, to lead a life of kindness and trustworthiness. And so again, when I was studying through this lesson, the message that kept popping into my mind was 1 Corinthians 13, yeah. because it says love suffers long, or love is patient, love is kind, it does not seek its own. If you're gonna truly bring honor to God, lead a life, live a life of kindness and trustworthiness. Ephesians chapter four, verse 32. Again, just write these references down, you can go back and read them later. But Ephesians verses four, or verse, uh, chapter four, verses 32 and onward, it says, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. That's the life of a Christian. That's the life that we should lead and that we should live for him. Amen. Proverbs 10 verse 9 says, he who walks with integrity walks securely, but he who perverts his ways will become unknown. Oh, that's interesting. Again, leading a life of kindness and trustworthiness. In Zechariah chapter 8 verses 16 and 17, listen to these words, powerful message here. These are the things you shall do. Speak each man the truth to his neighbor. Give judgment in your gates for truth, justice, and peace. Let none of you think evil in your heart against your neighbor. And do not love a false oath, for all these are things that I hate, says the Lord. He wants us to be trustworthy people. He wants us to be all about truth, and that's what we are. He is about truth, and we should reflect that character. When we go on to verses 5 and 6, it says, oh, you know this one. Tell me if it sounds familiar. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. But if you continue on to verses seven and eight, it's kind of an extension of that because it goes on to say, do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health in your flesh and strength in your bones. I love that. Not to think of yourself more higher than what you are. God comes first. We are below him, right? We, he, he must increase and I must decrease. And so the third point here is always trust in God and deny self, right? We're supposed to live a life of self-denial and of course, always uplifting him as much as we can. Jeremiah 17 verse nine. Here's a good one. Tweet this, Facebook this, put it out there. It's a beautiful text. The heart is deceitful above all things. Okay, everybody needs to know that. And desperately wicked, who can know it? We need to tweet that because the question is, we hear in our society and in our culture, oh, just trust your heart. Just follow your heart. But yet, can we trust self? Can I wake up each day and go, oh, Ryan, I got this. Jesus, just scoot on over. Give me the will. I can take this today. No, 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 no. Do not trust self. That's the thing we need to be reminded of each and every day. Psalm 28 and verse 7 says, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoices and with my song, I will praise him. And then of course, put in there with Luke chapter 22, verses 41 and 42, beautiful message. It says, and he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. We know these words all too well. This is all of what third, the third point here is summed up to. It says, and he knelt down and prayed. And what were his words? Father, if it, was your, if it is your will, take this cup from me. But what did Jesus say? Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And then, of course, we go on to verses 9 and 10 in Proverbs chapter 3. And what does it say? Honor the Lord with your possessions. Now, this is where the, the, the responsibility aspect comes in in regards to our resources. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. That's a promise that we can, we can, we can bank on. That's Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. And then, here's our fourth point. Be faithful stewards of God's resources. That's what God's saying. If you want to honor me, if you want to honor me and put me first, be faithful stewards of my resources. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 2 says, moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. faithful. Got to got got hunch that that's going to come up a few more times. But the idea of this, my friends, of course, what, it, what this the lesson is entitled, honor the Lord and putting him first. Thank you, Ryan. And now I begin Wednesday with the tithe contract, the tithe contract. I like what you mentioned earlier, Shelley, about contract and covenant. 
Covenant is what God is able to accomplish in spite of us and without us. But now this bilateral covenant is referred to in this lesson as a bilateral contract. And I could understand the way that the author sees it because of the conditions that God laid down in the journey of the Israelites. You know, there is a close connection between the practicing of tithe and the heart condition. Yes. Matthew 6, 21, the Bible says, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And so you look at the cadence in the life of the Israelites, which is the cadence in the life of many Christians. When they were obedient and they returned to God what belonged to him, they prospered. But when they were disobedient and did not return to God what belonged to him, they faltered. And it was between this obedience and prosperity and disobedience and problems that the book of Malachi was written to encourage the children of Israel, that God wants to bless them abundantly. But between the disobedience and obedience, the prosperity and the problems, Malachi comes in. And when you look at Malachi, Malachi is a book of return. Those four chapters, like the four chapters of Jonah or the four chapters of Philippians, they're small but concentrated. And if I could summarize the theme of the book of Malachi, it is return to me. I discovered in the book of Malachi, there's six things that God points out to the Israelites where they turned away from God. And then Malachi talks about one of them is tithe and offerings. Mm -hmm. But in the six rebukes that God gives, it's amazing. When you put that in there, put this phrase, in what way? Yeah. Six times when God showed them where they faltered, six times they said, in what way? Let's go to Malachi. Let's mm -hmm. look at this very quickly. In what way? Like God was, like God had a conniption of some sort, but that was not the case. Look at Malachi 1 verse 2. I have loved you, says the Lord, yet you say, in what way have you loved us? Mm. And then Malachi <laughs> 1 verse 6. Uh, uh, where is my reverence, says the Lord of hosts? And I'm going down further into the verse. To you priests who despise my name, yet you say, in what way have we despised your name? See, God is pointing out their condition. Yeah. They right. said, what are you talking about? In what way? Then we go to verse seven. You offered defiled food on my altar, but you say, in what way have we defiled you? And then you go to chapter two, verse 17. You have wearied the Lord with your words, yet you say, in what way have we wearied you? Continuing to question God's integrity and God's ability to read the human heart. And finally, we find in verse three, uh, chapter three, verse seven and eight, it says, um, Yet from the days of your fathers, you have gone away from my ordinances and not, have not kept them. Now watch this. Return to me and I will return to you. That's that bilateral contract. Mm, yeah. You do this and I will do this. This is a, if my people, then I'll forgive their sins. This is where God requires something of us. Mm -hmm. So the, the blessings of God are conditional. The salvation of God is unconditional. You have to just join, as Shelley said, you have to accept that covenant. But the Lord is saying, I will not bless you if you are not obedient to what I've laid out as the requirements of this blessing. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say... In what way shall we return? Mm. And then we get verse eight. Will a man rob God, you, yet you have robbed me. But you say, mm. notice that, mm. in what way have we robbed you? So you find this cadence, obedience, disobedience, prosperity, adversity. And it all comes down to the fact that the Israelites, like many of us, my wife and I could just pause and just talk about our lives right here because we've looked at the blessings in our lives at the simple foundation of, and I look at tithing and offering, not as the most we could do, but as the least we can do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, as David said, what shall I render unto the Lord for all yes. his benefits towards me? I mean, what else can I give to the Lord? So you can never outgive him. You can never over tithe. And by the way, you don't pay tithe. That's right. You return That's what true. already belongs to the Lord. Everything Amen. belongs to God. Amen, brother. <laughs> so God gives you 10 oranges and say, can I have one back? And you say, no but it's always his. It came from him and it goes back to him from a heart of obedience. So Malachi is that book of return. So I have, let me see, Jill. I have six things. Okay. Let's see if we can get through the, the tithing <laughs> covenant, this bilateral covenant. 
is hinged on these six things. Let's go to Psalm 116, verse 12. Our allegiance to God indicated with the phrase, return to me and I will return to you. And I just alluded to that, but let me give you the actual reference. Psalm 116, verse 12. Here is that response in our allegiance to God. Here's the text of allegiance. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits towards me? Mm. I mean, when you think about what God can do and what God has done and what God is capable of, can you really ask yourself, hmm, I don't know if you're capable of doing that. <laughs> this passage, David is saying, I know you can. So just tell me, what shall I do to express my gratitude? And what can I do? To what extent can I go to show you my heart of appreciation? So the first one is our allegiance to God. Point number two is our stewardship to God. We will not rob him if we are faithful in our stewardship. Deuteronomy 8 and verse 11. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God, by not keeping his commandments, his judgments, and his statutes, which I command you today. You find in Deuteronomy, this chapter here, the Lord was talking about how they build houses, they inhabit them, they have vineyards, they eat of them, they build these beautiful mansions, and then they say, my might and my power have gotten me my wealth. The Lord said, that's not the case. No, that's not how it works. All your blessings came from me. Right. And so this, this recognition of the second contract or the, the, the bilateral covenant with God is our stewardship to God. Third one is our submission to his refinement. Our submission to his refinement. We find here he will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. Mm -hmm. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver. There in Malachi chapter 3. But what is our response to the recognition of his refinement? Psalm 37, verse 5. Here's the response. Psalm 37, verse 5. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. Mm. Who do you know can bring all your desires that are godly to pass? Only one. That's the Lord. But you have to commit your way to him. Notice that agreement. You do this, I'll do that. That bilateral contract, that bilateral covenant. You commit your way to me, and this is what I promise I will do for you. Number four, our preparation to receive God's blessings. Now this is the reciprocal blessing that comes. You know, tithing and offering is a reciprocal blessing. It's a door that swings both ways to God, but the greater blessing is to us. What does he say in Malachi 3? Try me if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour you out for such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. I know that to be true. My wife and I have said many times, there are things that we can't even tell people about how God has blessed us. Mm -hmm. But it simply comes down to God saying, try me. You don't believe it? Give me a chance to prove myself. Friends, you want God to open his window. That's right. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Let God open his window on you and you'll see God's pour those, God will pour those blessings out. What would the result be? Psalm 1 th verse 3. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its seasons, whose leaf also shall not wither. And I love this. And whatever he does shall prosper. When you are faithful, God will show up. Number five, here it is. Our obligation to furnish the needs of God's work. God didn't give us everything just for self-satisfaction. God's work is reliant heavily on what he puts in our hands. As you have blessed others, God will bless you, that there may be food in my house. What's the response? Why does God give you that? Ephesians 4 verse 12, for the equipping of the saints, mm. for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Not only just your gifts and your talents, but your finances, your treasure. And finally, our desire to bless others. You will bless this whole nation. Mm -hmm. Our response, 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 14. But by an equality, that now at this time your abundance may supply their lack, that their abundance all also may supply your lack, that there may be equality. Mm -hmm. God says, I'll give to Jill and give Jill gives to you. I give to you and you give to Jill. And when we lack or when we have abundance, we are all together relying on the covenant that God made to bless us. As we do our part, I promise you, God will do his part.
Amen. Very nice. Thank you so much, Pastor John, each one of you. What an incredible study. My name is Jill Morricone, and on Thursday, we look at Seek Ye First, and we're going to Matthew chapter 6. But before we do that, it's just fascinating to me as I sit here on Thursday's lesson and hear each one of you talk. Really, we're talking about these conditional statements in the Bible, and that's actually where I'm starting with my lesson, okay. building off with some of the same scriptures that you all shared. You know, in logic and those type of related fields, in math and philosophy, we have this deductive reasoning with those mm -hmm. conditional statements with if, then. If this happens, then this happens. If I flip a light switch, what's going to happen? The light will come on. Then the light comes on. If you work overtime, what's going to happen? you will receive time and a half, if then statements. From a spiritual perspective, the lesson says many of the promises of God have elements of that bilateral contract. Mm -hmm. That is to receive the blessing, we need to do our part as well. We see these if then statements. Ryan, I think you referenced Exodus 19 mm -hmm. verses five and six. If you indeed obey my voice, keep my covenant, then you will be the special treasure to me above all the people of the earth, for all the earth is mine. We have Genesis 26. This is Abraham, shall we? Verses 4 and 5. This is kind of backwards of the if then. It starts with a then. I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because here comes the if. If, because Abraham obeyed my voice, mm. kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Amen. Pastor Johnny, you had Deuteronomy 28 with the law of blessing and cursing. If you diligently obey, right? There's the condition. If you observe carefully all his commandments, mm. if you don't serve other gods, then that entire chapter, all those blessings will pour forth. Romans 6, 23, what does it say? The wages of sin is death. So if you sin, then you will die. But it doesn't stop there. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So if you accept God's gift of salvation, then you will have eternal life. 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, then he will forgive and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. James 3.18, if you sow peace, you will reap righteousness. Hosea 10.12, if you sow righteousness, then you will reap mercy. Mm -hmm. 2 Corinthians 9.6, if you sow sparingly, then you will reap sparingly. But if you sow bountifully, what mm -hmm. happens? Then you will reap bountifully. Isaiah 26, verse 3, if you stay your mind on him, in the Hebrew it literally means to lean or rest upon him, then you will have perfect peace. Pastor John, I think you referenced this one, 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14, mm -hmm. if you humble yourself, pray, seek God's face, and turn from your wicked ways, there's a fourfold condition, then what's God going to do? He's going to yeah. forgive. He will hear from heaven. He will heal your land. So in Matthew chapter 6, let's turn there. We're going to read Matthew chapter 6. We see another conditional statement or if-then statement. And the bottom line is this. If you seek God first, last and best in everything, what's going to happen? Then he will add everything unto you. This passage, we're going to read verses 25 through the end through verse 33. It's interesting to me because sometimes I can be prone to worry. I don't know about the rest of you, but sometimes I can be prone to worry. And I think, oh, and I wonder what's going to happen with this. And I wonder what we should do with this. But this passage is powerful if you are prone to worry. And I have six reasons, Pastor John, okay. why we should not worry from this passage. So let's jump in. We're in verse 25. Therefore, I say to you, Jesus speaking, part of the Sermon on the Mount, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? 
The instruction given here, and also in Luke chapter 12, this teaching on worry that we're going to talk about is actually tied into instructions and parables for the rich who have made wealth and material possessions their God. And they're actually worried and obsessed with getting more. The primary application of this is really for the well-off in the times of Jesus, those who were wealthy. We could say the secondary application is for us today who have yet still are not satisfied. You ever notice that the poor Christians in poor countries, they seem happier hmm. than those who are in wealthy or developed oh. countries and yet are not satisfied with what we have. The universal application of this passage is for all Christians, rich and poor alike, that we don't need to worry, but we can trust God. So what is reason number one why we should not worry from this passage? Because life consists in more than outward externals. That's right. the first reason. Right. We think life consists in food. Life consists in shopping. Life consists in clothes. Life consists in houses. Life consists in cars. No, it does not. The solution is to readjust your priorities. Focus on God instead of all those external trappings. Let's read the next verse, verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Mm -hmm. Reason number two why we should not worry is because God cares for his creatures. How much more is our value than the animal kingdom? Solution is to trust God. Trust God to take care of you. Know if God cares for the birds, clearly God can take care of you. The next verse, we're in Matthew 6, verse 27. Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his statue? Reason number three, why we should not worry. Worry, it doesn't accomplish anything. Worry doesn't make us grow. Worry can't make you well if you're sick. Worry can't make you rich if you're poor. Worry really cannot change anything. That's right. The solution, choose to focus and believe in God, someone that can actually affect change. Instead of focused on the things that can't make any difference or that we can't change at all, choose to focus on the one who can affect that change. The next verse, verse 28. Why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Verse 30, now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow it's cast into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Mm, that's right. Reason four, why we shouldn't worry. Life and all the things we possess, it's not guaranteed. The grass is here today. It's gone tomorrow, cast into the oven. Anything in this life that we put our security in, it's transient. It can vanish in simply a moment. The solution is to put your trust in the never changing God. He says, I am God, I do not change. The things in this world, they change in a heartbeat, but our God never changes. Verse 31, Matthew 6, 31. Therefore do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Reason five, why we should not worry. Mm -hmm is that the Gentiles, the heathens, and the unbelievers worry. So why should we be like them? Mm, right. We're Christians, that's right? True. We believe in Jesus. We have confidence in him and in eternal life. So why would we be like the rest of the world that spend time worrying about the stock market, worrying about where their next meal's coming from? We can trust in God. The solution is trust the God that knows your needs. Mm. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He can provide for you. He knows exactly what you need. So trust God to provide for you. The last verse, this is the then. All the ifs come, this is the then. If you seek him, what happens? Verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Here comes the then. And then all these things will be added to you. Mm -hmm. Reason number six, why we should not worry. 
because God is the one ultimately who can provide for our needs. If we seek God first and last and best in everything, he will provide for us. And then you can go to sleep at night and you can rest. You can walk during the day and you can rest because your heart and everything that you possess belongs to God and you can trust him with your life. Amen. Thank you each and every one for such a beautiful lesson. And we want to give each of you an opportunity for a closing thought. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 2, it says, And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. This is a marvelous picture of what God wants to do for us. He says, it is as if God's blessings are coming. You're trying to outrun them, but they overtake you. God bless you. Amen. Amen. There's a powerful, uh, powerful quote from um, Councils on Stewardship, page, page 81, that was included in Tuesday's lesson. It says, not only does the Lord claim the tithe as his own, but he tells us how it should be re reserved for him. He says, honor the Lord with the substance and with the first fruits of all increase. This does not teach that we are to spend our means on ourselves and bring to the Lord the remnant, even though it should be otherwise an honest tithe. Let God's portion be first set apart. Amen. Amen. First Corinthians 10 verse 13, three words, very simple, but very profound. God is faithful. Mm -hmm. You cannot rely on anyone who consistently 24 hours a day, seven days a week, past, present, and future can say that God is faithful. That's why stewardship is where God opens the windows mm -hmm. to prove to you how faithful he really is. Amen. I want to quote a verse Ryan had quoted, Proverbs 3. I love that passage. Verse 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. So when you're tempted to worry, when life seems fraught with difficulty, when you don't know where your next meal comes from, trust in God. Lean upon him. When your marriage is falling apart and your kids are walking away from God, when you don't know what's going to happen, trust in the God right. who will never leave you nor forsake you. Amen. amen and amen. Thank you, each one of you. You know, I just want to say righteousness by faith is not mythical. Uh, God wants your destiny is to become like Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so obedience shows that we love him, that we trust him. It is the pathway to God's blessing. And in uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, says, now by this we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments, he who says, I love him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. So obey today and be blessed. Join us next time. We're really going to get into practical information on the tithing contract.